Watch this. Back from his trip to the border, Governor Brad Little is now sharing what he saw as Idaho works to fight the war on drugs from nearly 2,000 miles away. They announced plans to move their shelter back in January. So far, little movement thanks to opposition from neighbors. But the clock is now ticking as the owners of the current building have now given a timeline for their exit. Well, turns out that complaint against Dr. Ryan Cole, it was leaked by the Idaho Freedom Foundation. At least that's what the Idaho Medical Association is saying. Tonight, we're hearing what Dr. Cole has to say about this. Well, it is Tuesday, and so far it is a much slower week in Idaho politics compared to last week. Do you remember? That's when the governor went to the southern border to learn about the crisis there, and in his absence, the lieutenant governor stepped in and executed an executive order. Well, we talked a lot about that dynamic, but what about the trip to the border? Today, we spoke with Governor Little for the first time since his trip to learn more about his mission there. He was at the Idaho State Police headquarters comparing notes with ISP troopers and leaders who were sent to the southern border earlier this summer to help assist with the situation there. Texas Governor Greg Abbott and Arizona Governor Doug Ducey sent a letter back on June 15th to fellow governors in every state asking them for extra manpower to help secure the border. Now, Idaho compiled uh, a five person team that went on a 21 day mission to assist Arizona State Police with intelligence, ga intelligence gathering and investigative work related to drug addiction at the southern border. There are major issues and concerns with meth and fentanyl coming into the United States from Mexican cartels. And to set the stage here, we asked a question many of you had back in July when Idaho announced that they were sending their five troopers to the southern border. Many of you texted in. Why was Idaho doing this and was the whole thing simply a part of political drama, doing something for show? Well, Idaho State Police Colonel Kedrick Will says he had a message for leaders after they asked for his assistance. Here's what he told them. I explained to him that Idaho has no, uh, no interest in sending somebody down for any type of a show. We're sending workhorses. And, and that's what he wanted, and he said, if you'll send workhorses, we'll put them to work, and that's what he did. We sent the very best we had, and they, they used them as troopers are used to be working. So we got the picture. They were working down there. They weren't there for a holiday, to be clear. But what did the troopers do and see? Well, the short answer is they did and saw a lot. And Idaho State Police Sergeant Kurt Sprout was one of the troopers at the border working. We heard about his experience this afternoon. We worked in the southern Arizona area, and we'd go into towns in that area, or cities, and there were literally fentanyl drug dealers on every corner. Um, Impaired driving was awful. Um, and like I alluded to earlier, these people are so addicted to these highly addictive drugs that it totally consumes, it, consumes them. So they start committing crimes, some of them violent crimes. That was the most dangerous place I've worked in my career, I'll tell you that. And, and it wasn't even close. And so that's a direct link to what's going on at our southern border. And the experience we got was outstanding. And we've already implemented some of the things we've seen to include multiple large seizures of drugs that we've had since. I want to straighten this out so we're all on the same page. Governor Little was at the border last week. That was a separate mission from ISP when they went in July. Of course, all of it is correlated together, but I wanted to make sure we're all very clear here who went where when. Anyways, after learning from ISP's experience and from his own firsthand conversations and experience at the border, here's what Governor Brad Little had to say earlier about the next steps in the battle against illicit drugs coming into the United States. We have to do multiple things. We got to have, as we have with our Behavioral Health Council, we've got to have treatment, we've got to have ed education, we've got to have interdiction, interdiction. But right now the problem is it's so cheap and it's so abundant that it's going to overwhelm our system of what do we do for substance abuse for these people. Beyond that, Little and other Republican governors put together a 10 point plan that they say President Biden can take to end the crisis at the border. And we'll go over the 10 point plan here that Governor Little was a part of. It includes the following um, fully reinstate the migrant protection protocols and catch and release 
clear the judicial backlog. Uh, it also goes on to have a point about re-enter all agreements with our Northern Triangle partners in Mexico, send a clear message to potential migrants, and also deploy more federal law enforcement officers down at the border. So it is wait and see if any action at the border happens and if those actions translate into real differences. Now, of course, while Governor Little was at the southern border, his lieutenant governor, Janice McGeehan, stepped into his role and she was ready to go. As we told you, of course, she signed the executive order while Little was in Texas. So we asked him about it. Here is his response. I was, I was, I was uh, focused on this, and uh, we we took care of that. And uh, right now, this is the because this this is not even if even if the president implements all ten of these things, this problem is going to continue to fester. It seems like. You know, the change the subject back to talking on the border. So if you read between the lines here, you get the sense that Governor Little is ready to move on from questions about the lieutenant governor. I know it is our job in the media and we'll be asking about it going forward. But again, you can see when we asked about it earlier, that's what the governor has to say about that situation last week. And it looks like Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan will not be in court tomorrow. That's because her court date has been vacated by a judge. She was supposed to appear tomorrow afternoon on contempt of court charges for failing to provide a public records request to several members of our local media. And those requests were in regard to the Higher Education Task Force on indoctrination here in Idaho that McGeehan is running. Now she failed to comply and asked the judge to step in, but the judge refused and ordered her to release records. The Lieutenant Governor failed to do so in a timely manner, so the Idaho Press Club filed a lawsuit asking the court to hold her in contempt. The lieutenant governor eventually did release those records. Now, yesterday, the Idaho Press Club asked the judge in the case to drop the charges. McGeehan will still have to pay for attorney fees and court costs along with a $750 fine. Again, though, those charges have been dropped. She will not have to appear in court tomorrow. Yesterday, we told you that the Idaho Medical Association filed a complaint against Dr. Ryan Cole, the newest member of the Central District Health Board. Well, they're asking the Board of Medicine to investigate claims that Dr. Cole himself has made in public, saying that he has allegedly treated patients from California to Florida with ivermectin, a drug not approved by the FDA to treat COVID-19. Our Morgan Romero spoke with Susie Keller, who's the CEO of the Idaho Medical Association and one of the authors of the original complaint filed last week. She tells us that they never intended for the complaint to become public, as most complaints aren't, but now that it has, they're sharing why they feel like now is the time to file this complaint. Somehow the complaint made its way into the hands of the Idaho Freedom Foundation, and they are the ones who has made it public. And so we're now in the position of, of having to respond to that. The complaint is very narrow. We are not asking the Board of Medicine to investigate Dr. Cole's statements and misleading and dangerous words. What we are asking them to investigate is very narrowly the treatment aspect. Has he been treating patients? One thing to remember is Dr. Cole is a pathologist. He predominantly works in a lab. In fact, if you call his lab, they will say Dr. Cole is not a primary care provider and he is unable to write prescriptions. And it's hard to reconcile that with his previous statements that say, I've written hundreds of prescriptions for this treatment, which is not appropriate for COVID-19 patients. We did hear from Dr. Ryan Cole shortly after we went on air yesterday. And because we did share the IMA's complaint, we wanted to make sure we're thorough and that we shared Dr. Cole's response as well. And it says in part, quote, filing a complaint and threatening my license is unprofessional and sows distrust within the medical community and with patients in our state. My mission as a physician is to care for patients. I take my oath to do no harm very seriously. Continues, quote, we can do better as a profession than to silence those who have a different perspective. My attorneys and I will be working with other physicians and attorneys around the country who have been wrongfully attacked in the media and by those within the medical profession as we fight back against these unfounded complaints and actions. He says, I will continue to put the health and well-being of patients in our community, our state, and our nation first and foremost. 
Dr. Cole also invited members of the IMA to sit down with him to discuss their concerns. Again, the Board of Health will meet later this month for their regularly scheduled board meeting. From there, they can decide to take action or dismiss the complaint altogether. You can go right now to KTVB.com to learn more about this and read Dr. Cole's full statements on the matter. It's been 10 months since Boise's largest homeless shelter announced plans to relocate. But with little movement, the owner of their current building says they have to be out by summer. So some citizens are stepping in, urging the city to approve their permit. Is there a story you want us to cover? Tell us about it. The easiest way is through text message. Here's the number, 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. You can send us whatever questions or comments you have about the show or life in general. Just be warned, whatever you send us could end up on screen at the end of the show. Do you feel like the bad?
Well, if you were lucky enough to be high up in the mountains away from city lights early this morning, you may have seen a spectacular sight. Check this out. The Aurora Borealis, or more commonly known as the Northern Lights. This is video from the National Weather Service from Bennett Mountain in Schaefer Butte at Bogus Basin. About four o'clock this morning, they say it was visible as far south as Nevada, but it was even more visible the further north you went, hence the name, the Northern Lights. Check out these photos from Spokane and Coeur d'Alene area from last night, which probably don't even do it justice. It's one of those things you got to see at least once in person. Most of the pictures are from Washington State and from the Washington State Department of Transportation in Spokane, which is just across the border from Idaho. You can just see how clear the skies are to be able to see this phenomenon. I, I just love seeing this and Bree uh, Eggers is going to join us now and Bree, I know that we talk about the Northern Lights, but is there a time of year that they're better? Is it normal for this time of well, year? Well, uh, specifically for last night, you have to get away from city lights in order to be able to see it. And winter time is uh, when you've got a thinner atmosphere. So as the temperatures get colder, the atmosphere gets thinner as well. So you've got a better shot at this. A National Weather Service Boise said that was visible all the way down into northern Nevada, which is pretty far south. Uh, wouldn't be able to see it in Boise, but I know that there were some up at Schaefer Butte, Books Basin area where they got out of city lights, where they were able to see it last night. So incredible. I have never been lucky enough to see it, not even when I took a trip to Iceland. So maybe someday. How about this, though? Gorgeous view here. Sun Valley, white clouds, camera, beautiful stars there. And I love this fall coloring down here with the leaves and the white snow on Baldy. Just absolutely stunning. Clouds already increasing over the central mountains. The clouds will be ours tomorrow, but we kick the wind. Wind has still been pretty active through the day today for us. Less wind wind on the way for tomorrow, but we also lose the sunshine that we have with us right now. Current temperatures in the mid 50s for the Treasure Valley, low to mid 40s down through the Magic Valley in the next 12 hours. We've been talking about that freeze warning in effect for the Treasure Valley for tomorrow morning. I think many spots in the Treasure Valley will stay just very close to the freezing mark, but just above it. However, we will definitely make it down to freezing and sub freezing temperatures for Thursday morning. So if not tomorrow, we'll wait one more day and we will make it there. So it's just time to make those preparations now. Another cold front on the way in for the day tomorrow. That'll be increasing cloud cover may even bring us a quick sprinkle or even a quick flurry is on the car in the cards. I should say for us tomorrow, as you can see with our future cast here mid morning into about midday is when we have the best shot at seeing a few raindrops or even a few snowflakes, especially as you get into the mountain regions. I want to show you that seven day forecast here. Well, it will let me do that. Uh, seven day forecast is the all important forecast. Goodness, I've been having trouble with my clicker, but I will. Oh, well, goodness, if you want to see the seven day forecast, Joe, we've got it posted for you at KTVB.com. It's always available on the app as well. Uh, but I did want to bring this up Oh. because we got an interesting uh, comment on texted into us yesterday we because we asked, what do you want to see? On Here the it is. I love this. Let's read it. You go, Joe. No, this is you, Bree. Oh, I'm not a great reader. It's the full right. 208 experience. Well, look, yesterday, the, the comment was made. We want to know what you want to see. And so uh, Bill said, hey, thanks for asking. How about more about Idaho farmers, ranchers, dairy groups, their contributions to Idaho and their struggles and today's concerns? It's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. And so I went to producers today and I said, do you know today is National Farmers Day? Now I know. Tell and, us more. Well, I know a guy. Oh, uh, that, you know, near and dear to my heart. Uh, my dad is a, a fourth generation farmer from here in the Treasure Valley. And there he is on his uh, 1950s combine. That was last summer. Uh, really incredible there. But it's we a classic. Oh, you uh, we have just um, the most amazing stats to share with you about Idaho farming. You wouldn't believe some of the things coming out of Idaho. Did you know yeah. Idaho is the third largest agricultural state in the West. Right now, there are over 25,000 farms in the state. I mean, imagine that 25,000. They produce more than 185 different fruits, veggies, other commodities like peppermint, everything from grapes for wine, another one of my favorite things, dairy for cheese, another one of my favorite things. Uh, look how excited I get about farming. Did you know that about half the trout that's raised in the U.S., it comes from right here really? in the gym state? Wow. Yeah. We, we just have so much to be proud of here uh, in our agricultural community. And, uh, you know, it's a great bumper sticker, but also no farms, no food. That's true. And no wine. Yeah, and no wine. And yeah, the hops and the beer. Uh, real quick note, we are the number one producer I'm reading in potatoes, peppermint, and barley. Not bad. 
I, I do love that peppermint. So thanks for supporting the mint industry when you brush your teeth okay. every day, Joe. Oh, I don't. Okay. Well, we're going to step <laughs> away, but we will be right back after this. I do brush my teeth. I'm glad. And gum? Gum, yeah. Brush your teeth. Junior do it mints. all. Yeah. Interfaith Sanctuary is moving ahead with their plans to move their, their old shelter to the old Salvation Army building on State Street. Now, Interfaith already owns the new building, but they haven't received a conditional use permit from the city of Boise, which is required to use the building as a new shelter. So what happens if the new permit is not approved? Where will guests end up? Our Katia Stepovic found out that hundreds of people could be back living on the streets. Penny Beach is the chief medical officer with Family Medicine Residency of Idaho. She took to Facebook this week to ask for a helping hand from the community. The reason I wrote the Facebook post is that I'm not sure people are aware if Interfaith does not get this conditional use permit, they will be closing their doors next summer. They serve 200 homeless people every night. Um, and these, it's the only low barrier shelter in town. Boise Rescue Mission does a great job helping, also helping out with this population, but they have more rules regarding who can come to the shelter. So um, if Interfaith closes, there will be 200 more homeless people sleeping on the street starting next summer. She says right now the city of Boise is looking over Interfaith's application for a conditional use permit to operate as a shelter. She also says right now the city needs to hear from community members on the matter. In the winter, 
there is a real risk of this population freezing to death. Um, that's why Interfaith was established in 2005. It was because there was a homeless person who died on the streets of Boise freezing to death. So we cannot let these 200 beds go away. Beach says in her line of work, she cares for a lot of homeless patients. And if Interfaith had to shut their doors, that would exacerbate the situation in Idaho's already overwhelmed hospitals. Without Interfaith, we don't have anywhere to discharge a patient who might have chronic medical problems like congestive heart failure or um, some kind of wound on their leg. Um, so what would end up happening is we would keep that patient in the hospital for many more days, sometimes weeks, just to make sure they were safe to be discharged to the street, which would result in not only higher health care premiums, but um, just less room for people at our hospitals in town. The battle between shelter supporters and concerned neighbors over the proposed State Street location continues. I have a great deal of sympathy for the neighbors. I think they have totally valid concerns. And actually, I'm not in favor of big emergency shelters. She thinks the solution to getting those experiencing homelessness back on their feet is to find housing for them first and supportive services to follow. And I would like to see large emergency shelters go away altogether, but we don't have anything to bridge the gap between now and that solution, which will probably take a good five to ten years, considering the lack of housing in Boise. Um, I never knew that it would be facing such challenges and I'm stunned by it. So I'm heartbroken and scared. Many neighbors wonder why the shelter purchased the building before having a permit. Because you can't submit for a conditional use permit for a building until you own it. Peterson Steiger says the new owners of Interfaith's current building downtown will vacate them from the property if Interfaith does not make any progress with the new building in the next 12 months. But the board has decided that if this conditional use permit does not go through for this building, that Interface Sanctuary will shut its doors because there's nowhere else to go. As of now, the future of Interfaith is in the hands of the city. This building was zoned to be a shelter. And so the only reason why it wouldn't make it through this process is A, we're not listening to the recommendations needed for the conditional use permit, or there's discrimination or something else going on that's greater than anything Interface Sanctuary can do. I think that this conditional use permit needs to be approved and I think they need to go to State Street until we can figure out a solution, uh, kind of a more long-term solution. Well, you laid it out for us, Katya, a lot on the line here, and I'm curious, what's next in the permitting process? Well, we know that planning and zoning is currently looking over interface application internally, but coming up on November 15th, they will announce that their decision during a public hearing. Then, if anyone has an appeal, they can either appeal in person or write into the city. But here's the thing, the appeal must claim that planning and zoning specifically has done something procedurally incorrect. So on no November 15th, planning and zoning's decision will be final unless, of course, there is an appeal. Katya will keep us informed as it goes on. Thank you very much, Katya Stepanek, for reporting. And I think we've got time just to wrap up here. Yes, here we are. Some comments, and I'm squinting here. This says, hi, Joe. More Mo, please. Oh, pff, of course. Well, you know what? Mo is uh, a real team member of the 208, so you may be seeing him soon, maybe as soon as Friday. This one says, hashtag the 208. If you like to eat, thank a farmer. That's Jim in Boise. Yeah, as Bree mentioned, no farms, no farmers, no food. So thank a farmer today if you can. Um, I know a lot of you have been asking where Brian Holmes is. He will be back soon. He's on vacation. For now, though, you're stuck with me and the 208 team. We will be back tomorrow. We appreciate all the comments. Take care of each other. Do something kind today, and we'll be back here tomorrow at 5 p.m. on the 208.